The word of God is powerful. The word of God is strong. The word of God has all you need to have all your needs met. Join us for another life-changing journey into God's word. Welcome to The Higher Place UK. Um, so yeah, the topic for today is, is faith. And the title of the message is called Now Faith, Now Faith. And before we kind of go back and start relating things to what we just watched, I want us to have a really good understanding of what faith is. So for the sake of today's message, I'm going to give you a definition. So if you're taking notes, write this down. So faith is the name given to the action of obedience you take based on your conviction of who God is and the integrity of his word. So that's the action of obedience you take based on your conviction of who God is and basically how true his word is. Um, And if we go to Hebrews 11, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 7. Let's turn there together, and we're going to read in the TPT, which is the Passion Translation. So Hebrews 11, 1 to 7. It says, Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were condemned for. Somebody say faith empowers. empowers. With some energy, guys. Lovely. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Somebody say faith moved. Faith moved, able to choose a more acceptable sacrifice to offer God than his brother Cain. For God declared him righteous because of his offering of faith. By his faith, Abel still speaks instructions to us today, even though long dead. Somebody say faith translated. So faith translated Enoch from this life and he was taken up into heaven. He never had to experience death. Somebody say, faith living within us. Faith living within us. And if we read verse 6, it says, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming, even things that he had never seen had never been seen, sorry. But he stepped out in reverent obedience to God and built an ark that would save him and his family. By his faith, the world was condemned, but Noah received God's gift of righteousness that comes by believing. Amen. So the first thing I want us to understand and to know about faith is that faith is alive. Faith is alive. And all throughout the scriptures, you saw that actually that the the word of God, it attributes like doing words, verbs, directly after the word faith. It said faith moved Abel, faith opened Noah's heart, faith translated Enoch. And in verse 6 it says without faith living within us. And so faith is alive and it needs to be alive in us um, to please God. The second thing I want us to understand about faith is that faith is not hope. Faith is not hope. Hope is essentially a desire that what we want to happen. It's basically what we desire to happen, what we wish to happen, and it's not faith. It is essential to faith, but it isn't faith. Whereas faith is what we know to happen, and hope is what we wish to happen. The scriptures say that faith is the confirmation of what we hope for. So they're two, they're two separate things. Faith is actually the evidence that what we, we are hoping for is true, is that confirmation. The third thing that we should know about faith is that faith exists in the present tense. Faith exists in the now. And that's why I named today's type of sermon, Now Faith. In Hebrews, Hebrews 11 verse 1, the first thing it says is, Now Faith is. And some people might think it's just the way it introduced it, but it spoke to me. Now Faith is. And where hope will say, I will have it one day, faith says, I have it now. Hope will say, I will be healed. Faith says, I am healed. Faith exists in the present tense. It lives in the present tense. And to, yeah, to allow faith to live within us, we must change our language, we must change the way we speak. 
and we must exist in the present tense because faith is very much now. And essentially, if faith can be alive in us, faith can also be as small as a mustard seed, it can always also be mature and wise and as big as a mountain in us, and it can also be dead. Faith can also be dead in us, it can be dead. So the, you see there's like different stages of faith and faith can go through different cycles in our life. And so that's why I really wanted us, I hope that all makes sense before we really kind of link it back to um, the movie today. So um, essentially the first thing that kind of stood up to me from this movie in line with the scriptures is that faith comes by hearing, which is the first point. Faith comes by hearing or it's birthed by hearing. And you see the main character, Chris Gardner, he, he kind of went through a lot, a lot of trauma. His wife left him, he had to sleep in a toilet one, one night. And for him, his faith started when he encountered a stockbroker. And he's like, oh man, you've got a nice car, like, how did you get to where you are? And the, you must have to go to university or whatever it is. And the stockbroker said to him, not really, you just have to be good with numbers, good with people. And in that moment, he kind of thought, well, I'm good with numbers, I'm good with people. And you see here, that's where his faith kind of began. It started with hearing, actually, that it was possible for him. And in line with the scriptures, if we read Romans 10, verse 17, it says, so faith comes from hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. Faith comes from hearing. And if we read that same verse, well, in the, in the TBT, quite paraphrased, so it's not at the back, it says faith is birthed. It, it gives its birth in the heart that responds to the word. And so the first stage for Chris Gardner was, was hearing. And I want us to read another scripture and look at two characters that we're going to kind of go back to in um, the story of Jairus and the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And so this is going to be like our anchor text. We're going to read a lot of different scriptures, but we'll keep going back to this one. And we can find it in Mark 5, um, 21 to kind of 34 and onwards. So yeah, that's Mark 5, 21, 34 onwards in TPT. And we'll read it together. It says... After Jesus returned from across the lake, a huge crowd of people quickly gathered around him on the shoreline. Just then, a man saw that it was Jesus. So he pushed through the crowd and threw himself down at his feet. His name was Jairus, a Jewish official who was in charge of the synagogue. He pleaded with Jesus, saying over and over, please come with me. My little daughter is at the point of death. And she... She's only 12 years old. Come and lay your hands on her and heal her and she will live. Immediately, Jesus went with him and a huge crowd followed, followed, pressing in on him from all sides. And the scriptures doesn't explicitly say that Jairus heard anything about Jesus, but the way he acted indicated that he must have. He must have heard about this man called Jesus. He was healing people, who he was setting people free, who were doing amazing things. So when he heard, he, had, he was in a situation where his daughter was very unwell. And so he's like, well, Jesus is around. He threw himself at his feet and he, starts, he says, come with me, Jesus. And Jesus went, goes with him. And in the midst of that, there's, there's a woman who's also there and will continue to read. And from verse 25, it says, now in the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered horribly from continual bleeding for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all she had on their treatments, she was getting worse instead of better. Verse 27 says, when she heard about Jesus' healing power, someone say she heard. She heard heard about Jesus' healing power. She pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. So this woman had been suffering for many for many years and she's also heard about what Jesus can do. And so she puts two and two in her head. She's like, you know what, I've got this issue. This man has been healing people. He might be able to heal me. When she heard that, she pushed through the crowd and she came up behind him and touched his prayer shawl. Verse 28, for she kept saying to herself, if I could touch even his clothes, I know I will be healed. As soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped. She knew it, for she could feel her body instantly being healed of the disease. Jesus knew at once someone had touched him, for he felt the power that always surged around him had passed through him for someone to be healed. He turned and spoke to the crowd, saying, Who touched my clothes? His disciples answered, What do you mean who touched you? Look at this huge crowd. They're all pressing against you. But Jesus' eyes swept across the crowd, looking for the one who had touched him. 
When the woman experienced this miracle and realized what had happened to her, she came before him trembling with fear and threw herself at his feet saying, I was the one who touched you. And she told him her story of what just happened. In verse 34, then Jesus said to her daughter, because you dared to believe, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. Be free from your suffering. And I like that, that what Jesus said at the end there. She, he said, because you dare to believe, your faith has healed you. And he uses belief and faith. So they're not the same thing. Faith isn't just believing. Like I said, it's alive. It's not hope. It exists in the present tense. And it's not just belief. It goes more than that. And we'll talk a bit more about it as we go through. But Jairus and this woman, they both heard it all started from their hearing and we'll see um, as we keep going through the second thing about faith is that faith speaks so firstly faith is birthed from hearing like we saw in the movie like we saw saw in the scriptures the second thing is that faith speaks Um, and in the movie you might not have seen it too much chris gardner the main character he would often say things it's going to be okay i'm the right guy for this job he put himself out there he was like one time he told his wife, don't worry, I'm going to come back without this device. He was certain, of, he had this certainty, he had this faith about it. And he would speak and he would say things. And similarly, in the scriptures, the woman with the issue of blood, she spoke. She also spoke. So if we look at Mark 5, 28, it said, For she kept saying to herself, if I could touch even his clothes, I know I will be healed. She kept saying it to herself. After she had heard Jesus was around, she heard about his healing power, then she began to speak, if I could get close enough to touch him, then I will be healed. Same thing with Jairus, the Bible says that he kept saying over and over when he came to plead with Jesus, in Mark 5, 23, he says, come lay your hands on her and she will live, come Jesus, lay your hands on her and she will live, the Bible says that he said that over and over, so faith can't afford silence, faith cannot afford silence. In this world, there are so many like negative opinions spoken over us, and it cannot afford silence. Same thing with Chris Gardner. There were so many negative things people said. In his um, internship, he was treated less than. His wife also spoke to him in a certain tone. And if he allowed that to sink into his person, his faith would have been taken away at that moment. Faith cannot afford silence. It cannot afford silence. In 2 Corinthians 4, 13, it says, we have the same spirit of faith that is described in the scriptures when it says, first I believed, then I spoke in faith. So we also first believe, then speak in faith. So it's really important, first comes hearing, the faith is birthed, and then it must start to speak. It must speak. Same thing in Psalm 107 verse two, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It didn't say let them hope so, let them wish so, let them think so, it said let them say so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let them say so. If you are healed, then say so. If you are blessed, then say so. This is what God has said about us, about who we are. And the thing about the finished work of Christ is that it's finished, it's it's been settled. We don't have to add to that. We don't have to do X, Y, and Z to add to the written scriptures. It is finished. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? Amen? Next thing about faith is that faith acts. So faith is birthed by hearing, faith speaks, and then faith acts, faith acts. So Chris Gardner, he heard about that it was possible for him. He ran into a stockbroker and he heard that it was possible for him. He starts to speak it, he starts to believe it, and then he acts on it. He, he forced himself essentially to rooms where he would be seen. He chose to show up each day at that internship until they invited him to an interview. Even at the interview, you guys saw, he, was, he wasn't ready for it on that day, but he charmed his way through. And his faith was acting for him. And it's not just any action, it's a faith action, it's a faith action. And it's important we know, we know the difference. It's so important we know the difference. Um, in line with the scriptures, faith acts. James 2, 14. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, what good is it if someone claims to have faith but demonstrates no good works to prove it? How could this kind of faith save anyone? How could this kind of faith save anyone? In the same chapter, but James 2, 17, it says, so then, faith that doesn't involve action is phony, is fake, is not real. Um, in the King James Version, that same James 2, 17, it says, thus also, faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. 
in the voice. The same is true with faith. Without actions, faith is useless. By itself, it's as good as dead. It's as good as dead. And you can see the scriptures here saying it isn't enough to just believe that there is a God. It isn't enough to just believe that even God is good. It's not enough to just believe that you must have faith. Your faith must first start by hearing, then speak, and then action. In James 2 verse 19, this is what the scriptures say. You can believe all you want that there is one true God. That's wonderful. But even demons know this and tremble with fear before him. Yet they're unchanged. They remain demons. It's not enough to just know. That's what believing is. Faith is that next step. It's not enough to just know. Because demons also know. They remain the way they are. They remain unchanged. And essentially, that's how it is when we believe but we don't have faith. Our life remains the same. See, the woman of the issue of the blood, she, she acted, she had a faith action. In Mark 5, 27, it says she pushed through the crowd and she came up behind him, close enough to touch his prayer shawl. She pushed through the crowd. Similar with Chris Gardner, he was like, I must be seen in this room. This woman pushed through to get the crowd to get to Jesus. And as soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped and she was healed. There must be action, there must be action. Um, and I'll share with you like a story, a personal story of mine. Um, so you guys might know I got married in July. Um, and also last month, I was on honeymoon with my husband Daniel at the back. Um, and we went to Cornwall and we were there for like a week. And usually the way we study the scriptures, the way we just study our Bible is that we pick a topic and we might study it for like one or two weeks depending on what the topic is. For example, the Holy Spirit or peace or whatever it is. And the week of our honeymoon, we decided to study faith. We decided to study faith. Um, and so all throughout the week, we were studying faith. And by the end of it, we were there for six days. We were really charged, really excited about faith. We were like, yeah, we know so much about faith. We're excited. We're like, bring it on, enemy. Whatever trial you have, we're ready for it. Like, that's how amped we were. And so, yeah, at the end of the week, really refreshed, we decided to come home because we were really excited to be in church on the Sunday for the first week of this series about the movies. We heard he was preaching on um, Infinity Wars and we had actually been watching Marvel that whole week. So we were really excited to be in church on that Sunday. Um, so yeah, we rocked up to the train station like quite early because I'm an early bird. Like 30 minutes for our train at like 10.45 in the morning. And kind of the first thing that I saw as we got out of the cab was that there was this sign that said there are no Great and Western Railway trains today because of strike action. I was like, that can't be right. I booked my ticket, I paid online, I picked this date and it didn't stop me so there must be trains. And then I started to look online, I made a call to the people and it all confirmed that there were no trains to get out of Cornwall. I was like, oh my gosh. Anyone who's been to Cornwall knows it's like a four hour, five hour journey and there was no trains. So okay, cool. I started to look at like, alternative routes to get out of Cornwall because we really, we had a desire to be in church. We started looking at flights and that wasn't an option. It was like 300 pounds and it was like, there was too many changes and it just wasn't going to work. And my phone produced this option. It, it was like quite a few changes, maybe like six changes and it was like 10 hours. It was a long journey. Um, so we were just like, okay, let's try this route. And it was like, you had to walk to this train station or this bus station get the coach from here to Plymouth, from Plymouth to get the bus, and it was really long, but we're like, we're going to try it, we have to try it, we want to be in church. And we actually ran into a family of four who were in the same problem. They showed up at the train station trying to get to London, so we decided like to go together. So yeah, we're just making small talk as we walked to the first stop of this six hour to ten hour journey. Um, and it was to the coach station. So we walked about 10 minutes to the coach station, and so I got to the coach station, and we were like to the guy, okay, so my phone is telling me that if we catch a coach from here to this place, we might be able to get to, to London. And they were like, we don't know anything about that coach. This is the local coach station. <laughs> National Express, they do stop here, but we, we don't know anything. If you want a ticket, you have to go online. I was like, okay, we're rational, let's go online, let's get a ticket. Went online, and I'm seeing that the tickets are sold out. There are literally no tickets left. And the next coach to get out of Cornwall was at like 10, traveling overnight, and it was costing like 200 pounds because there was no train. So a lot of people were wanting to get the coach, so they had inflated the prices. 
I was like, that's not an option. And then at this point, I was just like, what is this? And I realized, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. I started getting excited. I was like, this is it. This is the trail. We've just been studying faith. This must be it. I was like, yeah, this is cool. This is it. So we got excited, and the other family who were with us, they were like, they were really stressed out at this point. The mom, she was looking online, she was like, maybe if we go back to the hotel, they might be able to let us in. She was looking at like prices, and she was showing me, she's like, oh yeah, this one's really cheap. I was like, yeah, that looks good, that looks good. And she goes to me, well, what are you going to do? I was like, I'm going to pray, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, like, that's the only thing I can do. And she was like, okay, fine, we're going to go and check if the hotel will take us back. And so they left, and me and Daniel, we stayed at the coast station because it was like maybe an hour and a half wait for the coach to actually come. So yeah, we stayed at the coach station, and once we finally realized that this was it, I was just like, okay, what I know about faith, faith comes by hearing, faith speaks, faith acts. I was like, cool, my faith right now needs to hear because we've got a lot against us right now. Online are saying that it's sold out, there's like 10 different changes. At each stage, we might need a new ticket, it's a 10 hour journey, what if we don't make it? There was a lot against us. Sherelle had already like dropped the church laptop at my house. I was thinking, am I gonna have to ask her to go back and get it? There was just a lot going through my mind. My faith needed to hear something at that moment. So I went to Google and I just typed in scriptures on breakthrough. And so I'll share with you guys some of the things I read. So I read Ephesians 6 verse 12. And that says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil heavenly places. And I was like, yeah, this battle is not physical, it's spiritual. I was like, I don't care if there's no more seats on this train. My seat is on this, is on this coach. Our seats are reserved. And I was like, my faith is getting amped up at this moment. And I also read Hebrews 4 verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I was like, yeah, the word of God is alive. It's got to work for me today. And I was getting excited, more excited. My faith was hearing. I also read 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And it says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all the sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And I was like, yeah, all the graces are abounding to me right now. The grace of favor. And we just we just began to pray and it wasn't even long it was like five minutes all in all i started praying dan started praying and then it was like five minutes one minute to search scriptures one minute to be encouraged one minute to pray Um, and after that we just kind of continued watching our marvel movie on our phone because we we were going to be in church that was our belief so our hope was that we would be in church and our faith confirmed that so then our actions were in line with that we were watching it because we were going to catch Hugh's message and that was it and so we waited for the coach to turn up about an hour and a half later. And so people were kind of lining up. And I pulled down back. I was like, let them go first. They, their tickets are physical. Ours are in heaven. Let them go first. <laughs> so we then got to the end of the queue. And like, well, maybe four people were away. And the coach driver, there was this lady who was obviously having an issue with her ticket. And he kind of just says, well, if you don't have a ticket, you're not getting on. I was like, oh my gosh, he's me. <laughs> he's a me bus driver. In that moment, I could have been scared. I could have let fear get me, but I was like, no, it's fine. They don't have the favor we have, it's cool. We got to the front of the line and I just started explaining. I was just like, look man, this is my train ticket. There are no trains today. And I just explained the situation we're in. And he tried to cut me off. I was like, no man, you don't understand. We need to be on this coach. We need to get home. And he's like, okay, okay, just stand to the side. Let me see what I can do for you. Um, And then he addressed the other customers and sadly the family four didn't get on. But he was like, you can, the space for you too. He's like, I'll sell you a ticket. He starts looking on his like machine thing. He's like, oh, it's like 50 pounds from here to Plymouth. I was like, that's a bit much. He's like, yeah, that is a bit much. Then he was like, let me see if I can make a child's ticket at a railway. Still brought it down to about um, 15 pounds. He was like, still, that's a bit much per person. I was like, can you just sell us one? He was like, yeah, go on then. And he sold us one and we got on the coach. And it took us to Plymouth, and similar thing happened at Plymouth actually, because we found that there was a coach to Heathrow. I was just like, if we can get to London, we can figure this out. Yeah, two-hour journey home from from Heathrow, many changes, but it's still London. Same thing happened. He kind of looked online. I don't think he sold us one ticket. I think he was a bit more mean. But long story short, we got on the coach. We made it to London, and we were in church the next day. Um, to the glory of God. 
And our faith, it worked for us that day, it worked for us that day, because if we were scared or timid, we wouldn't have even tried. And that's the power of faith. Amen? The fourth thing I want us to understand about faith is that faith calls the spiritual realm into the physical realm. It calls the spiritual realm into the physical realm. And I've got a question for you guys. Do invisible objects exist? Yeah, they do exist. They're just unseen. Like, if you see in movies, when like, you see the spaceship, they put on their like, like, reflective panels and the ship disappears. But it's still there, it's just not seen. And that's what faith does. It causes the spiritual realm into the physical realm. These things are true, they're real, they exist. All the promises of God are real, they're true. They're just in a different realm, they're just unseen. And oftentimes, all of our problems, all of our issues are in, they exist in the visible realm. So we see them maybe every day, every week, we're, we're faced with our circumstance, our situation. Same thing with Chris Gardner, he had a lot of struggles and difficulties. Um, if we read 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18, it says, we view, sorry, we view our slight, short-lived troubles in light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an internal, weighty glory far beyond all comparison. Verse 18, it says, because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. You see, what we see before us is temporary, but the, the physical, the spiritual realm is eternal, it's eternal. And if we go back to Hebrews 11, which we read at the start, it says in verse 1, it says, Now faith brings our hope into reality and becomes a foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is the evidence to prove what is unseen. You see, faith is the evidence that proves what we don't see. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. And faith actually calls it from the um, unseen world to the seen world. Faith calls it from the invisible world to the visible world. Um, also in verse 3 of Hebrews 11, it says, Faith empowers us to see the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's word. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to what is seen. You see that the invisible realm gave birth after God spoke to what is seen. That's why it's important that our faith speaks because it starts to call, it starts to give birth to things that exist, they just exist in a different realm. And I want us to read another um, kind of biblical example of this in 2 Kings 6, 8 to 17. It says, I'll give you guys a second to get there. 2 Kings 6, 8 to 17 in NLT. It says, when the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officials, his officers, and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on high alert there. Essentially, there's the king of Israel, the king of Aram, and the king of um, Aram is always, he's always got these plots against Israel. He's always trying to sneak up on them and send the kind of attacks their way. And there's this man of God, Elisha, and each time the king of Aram would make a plan against Israel, I guess God would reveal it to him. And Elisha would tell the king of Israel, this is what's going to happen. So if I was you, I would go a different way to avoid the attack, or I will just be heavily armed in that area. And in verse 11, it says, the king of Aram became very upset over this. He called all his officers together and demanded, which of you is the traitor who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? And they said, it's not us, my lord. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words that you speak in the privacy of your room. And he says, go and find out where he is so that I can send troops and seize him. So the king finds out that it's a prophet called Elisha. He's like, right, we're going we're gonna to end this today. Let's go and get him. In verse 15, it says, when the servant... Oh, no, I've missed a few verses. No, let's go back. In verse 14, so they, they got a report that Elisha was at Dotham. Um, so one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. 
Verse 15, it says, When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and he went outside, he saw that there were chariots, horses, troops everywhere. So Elijah's servant, he's got up, he's come outside and he's seen this great army. He's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look outside, what are we going to do? He says to Elijah, oh sir, what are we going to do now? And he began to cry. And that's oftentimes what our lives look like. We, we get up and we just see armies of things against us, troops, we see all sorts of things in the visible realm, in the seen realm, that's what we can see. And Elisha, he says, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than there are on their side. And Elisha didn't say, there will be more on our side. He didn't say, help is on its way. He basically said, help is here. He said, there are more right now than there are on their side. And that's oftentimes what we might do in our lives. We might be in a sticky situation and we might even start to pray, God, send help, send help. God, help us, help us. But your help is already here. God has already saved us. He's already helped us. We just need to change the way we speak. So Elijah said, there are more on our side than there are on his. And this was his prayer. He prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots on fire. That's the heaven's army. And he could see that actually there were more for them than there were against them. That was the invisible realm. Just because he could not see it doesn't mean that they weren't there. Elisha could see it and he asked to, for him to open the young man's eyes. And that's how we know faith, it calls the invisible to the visible realm. We just need to open our eyes and see. Amen. Amen. And I also want us to briefly talk about doubt. I want us to talk about doubt because that's probably one thing that underpins faith is doubt. And yeah, it is, it is what it is. A lot of people do experience doubt and experience fear. fear sorry. Um, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty and it's a lack of conviction and is literally the opposite of faith. And fear is an emotion that kind of is, it causes, is caused by threat of danger, pain, or even harm. Like fear of the embarrassment, it, it prevents us from speaking a certain way. It prevents us from saying, oh, actually, I am healed. In the physical realm, the disease might still be present, but in the spiritual realm, we are healed. And it, fear kind of prevents us from speaking that way. And when we don't speak, doubt gets in. And when doubt gets in, that's what underpins faith. Um, so I want us to go back to our two main characters, Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood. Um, and that's in Mark 35. And we'll continue to read the story of Jairus to 42. And it says, and before he had finished speaking, people arrived from Jairus' house and pushed through the crowd to give Jairus this news. There is no need to trouble the master any longer. Your daughter has died. And at that moment, he could have been afraid, he could have had doubt in his heart. And I just thought it was quite interesting that these people who were delivering the bad news, they pushed through the crowd to get to him. They couldn't have just waited, like his daughter was dead, like that's not news that you want to deliver urgently, but they were determined to get that bad news to him. Why? And if we continue to read in 36, it says, Jesus refused to listen to what they were told and said to the Jewish official, don't yield to fear. All you need to do is keep believing. Um, and I believe that's a word for us today. We should, don't yield to fear. Don't worry, don't yield to fear. All we need to do is keep on having faith. Keep on having faith. And if we read the end of that story, it said, so they left for his home, but Jesus didn't allow anyone to go in with them except Peter and two brothers, Jacob and John. When they arrived at the home of the synagogue ruler, they encountered a noisy uproar of people among people, and they were all weeping and wailing, weeping and wailing. Upon entering the home, Jesus said to them, why all this grief? Why all this weeping? Don't you know that the girl is not dead? She's merely asleep. So even Jesus, he understood his faith was speaking. He didn't say, she will be sleeping soon. He said, she is asleep, she's not dead. That was how Jesus spoke, his faith was also speaking. And he, Jesus, he understood faith, he had faith. And in verse 40, he says, then everyone began to ridicule and make fun of him. That's often why we don't speak out, because we're, we're afraid of what people might say. But he threw all of them outside, 
Then he took the child's father and mother and his three disciples and went into the room where the girl was lying. And that's what we need to do with doubt. We literally need to cast it out because it does not belong in our lives. It underpins our faith. We need to cast it out. In verse 41, it says, He tenderly clasped the child's hand in his and said to her, Talitha Kum, which means little girl, wake up from the sleep of death. Instantly, the 12-year-old girl sat up, stood on her feet and started walking around the room. Everyone was overcome with astonishment. Everyone was overcome with astonishment. You see, Jesus' faith there was working for him. It was working for him. And Jairus, he was moments away from doubt. He was moments away from experiencing fear, but he did not yield. He did not yield, and Jesus cast the people out. And that's essentially what we have to do with doubt in our lives. We need to cast it out, and we cannot yield to fear. We cannot yield to fear. And, and I want us to read um, Mark 11, 22 to 23, also about doubt, um, in the NLT version. It says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. And there are two things that I want to pull out from this scripture that are quite important. Um, the first thing is that it says, have faith in God. And we, that's, where, that's where faith starts, really. We need, our conviction is in God, it's in who he is, it's in his word. We need to have faith in God, not in how well we pray, not in any sermon, not in even Sunday service, in God. Because he is a good father who has it's a lot of things in our lives are already settled. He's already done the finished work. And the second thing I wanted to extract from this scripture was, it says, uh, verse 23, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. You see, it's fine when things come, people are going to say things, Words are going to be said. People are going to try and discourage you. And that's okay as long as it goes in and out and doesn't get into your heart. The scripture says that if he does not doubt in his heart, why is that? Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what we know about faith is that faith also speaks. So if we start speaking doubt, that's, that's the opposite of faith. So we can't allow doubt into our hearts. It's fine if, you know, the thoughts come. They will come. And you just dismiss them as quickly as they came. Don't allow doubt into your, your heart. Um, and I also want us to read this last verse in Romans 4:18. 18. Um, it says, against all odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word, and as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration, uh, declaration over him came to pass. And I love the introduction to that verse. It says, against all odds, when it looked hopeless. And a lot of us are in that situation. It just doesn't look like it's going to work out. It doesn't look like it's going to work out. And the scripture says that he took God at his word. And that's what we have to do, essentially. Just take what God has said in his written word. Take it for what it is. We are healed. We are saved. Take it for what it is and start to prophesy it over your life. Start to speak it over your life and cast out fear. And the something that I also want to share with you, um, when I was preparing this message, Holy Spirit kind of brought it back to my memory. Um, so I thought he wanted me to share it with you, so I will. Um, so I was working in, like, during COVID, like a few years ago, I was working in hospital, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, so I was working like the critical care setting. And like, we just look after people who are essentially in comas, like look after their joints and stuff while they're unable to themselves. Same thing with their like respiratory muscles, we just help look after them whilst they're kind of unconscious and stuff. And there was this patient who I was seeing, and she was quite unwell, she was quite unwell, she had COVID, and um, she wasn't yet at the stage where she needed to be put in a, in a coma, essentially. And she wasn't quite at the stage where she needed invasive ventilation. Um, she was on non-invasive ventilation, which is just she had a quite big mask held in her breathe. And she was doing relatively poorly, and the doctors, they came by, and in hospital, um, if you're an adult, and if you're conscious, and if you're able to make important decisions, they will ask you before they do anything, because they need your permission, 
if they can do a certain procedure. So they had come round to my patient and they were asking her essentially, if you were faced with a life or death situation, kind of if you got worse, we need to have your permission so that we can do what we can to save your life. And they basically asked her in that way. I don't quite remember it as clearly. And for some reason, she just wouldn't answer them straight up. She just kept saying, I will not die, I will live. I will not die, I will live. And she just kept saying that. And the doctors were like, yeah, lady, we get it. That's nice. You're not going to die. But we need to know if you were on the brink of death, we need to know if we can do what we can to save your life. And she just did not answer. She was like, I will not die. I will not die. She was breathless. And she just kept saying it. And even me in that moment, I was just like, lady, why won't you answer them? I didn't get it back then. I did not get it back then. And I think the Holy Spirit brought, to, brought it to my mind is because I, I understand it now. It makes sense to me now. Her faith was speaking. And when that memory came back to me, the Holy Spirit said that woman was in faith. That woman was in faith. And it's even against all odds, in a hopeless situation, her faith was speaking for her. Because she had taken the written scriptures for what it was. And she was declaring, I will not die. I will live to declare the words of the Lord. And that's what she was saying. And I would like to tell you that she survived. Honestly, I don't remember what happened to her. But um, I, I would like to believe that she did survive. Um, but Holy Spirit said I should share that with you because... It's just a, a beautiful example of faith. Against all odds, when things look hopeless, that's when our faith will begin to work for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'll just ask you guys to rise to your feet, come to an end. Um, and I hope that you guys can go back and watch that movie, um, Pursuit of Happiness, and just kind of link it back to faith and see how his faith worked for him. And at the end, you saw that he got the job. He got the job. And just to recap, faith is alive. Faith is not hope. Faith exists in the present tense. Faith comes by hearing. Faith speaks. Faith acts. Faith looks beyond the scene into the spiritual realm and it calls it into the physical realm. And faith casts out doubt. Amen. So I just want us to pray. And I just want us to make declarations. Whatever you remember the scriptures have said about you, just begin to say it as you are, as though it is a reality. Whatever your current reality might be, it doesn't matter. It's because God has already said a thing about you. And the great thing about finished work is that it's finished. And it's true. And it's real. And it exists in the invisible realm. So just call it forth into your physical realm, into your, your reality. Begin to speak. Our faith needs to speak. Yes, Lord. We are blessed. We are blessed, we are saved, we are healed, we are strengthened. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your finished work. For your finished work, we just bless you. We thank you for your gift of salvation, that we are saved. Lord, we begin to call forth whatever your promises have been over us, from the spiritual into the physical, into our current reality, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your scriptures are true. Your written word is alive and it is working for us right now. It is working for us right now. Our help is here. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Yes, Lord. I pray that we're going to grow in confidence in our faith because the size of our faith is not the issue. It's not the size that's the issue. It's the confidence. Lord, I pray that this week we'll begin to exercise our faith. Yes, Lord, we surround ourselves in places that we can hear. Our faith can be stirred up so that we can speak over ourselves, so that we can declare over ourselves. Lord, I ask that you begin to reveal to us what actions we need to do. Earlier I was talking about faith actions and how Faith actions are very different to normal actions and they're different to just any old works. When I was trying to pay for our wedding, when me and my husband were trying to pay for our wedding, we did all the calculations in January and we were like 7,000, 8,000 pounds short and it looked hopeless. So like, where are we going to get this money from? And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke a word to my heart. He spoke a word to my heart and he said, your wedding is paid for in full. I received it, I said, yeah, my wedding is paid for in full. And the scripture that he used to give me that word was um, the scripture about feeding the 5,000. 
And he said, the same way those people were fed is the same way your wedding is going to be paid. They had the two, they had the five loaves and the two fish, and they just kept dividing it. They just kept dividing it, and it was enough. Somehow it was enough. And Holy Spirit said to me, just keep paying, making payments, making payments, and it will be enough. And praise the Lord, it was enough. And you see, the thing about the written word, the Logos word of, of God, is that it is in the Bible. And you have the Rhema word, which is the reveal word. And the Holy Spirit often, he reveals to you personally from that word what it is he wants you to do. So if you're not sure how your faith can act, ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what it is he wants you to do. What are the steps that you need to take? How can you act in faith? And the Holy Spirit will show it to you. Yes, Lord, give us, give us a rain, give us a revelation of how we can act in faith, how we can speak in faith, Lord. We just give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, Lord. We believe in you, we have faith in you, Lord. We have faith in your word, we know that it is true, and it is working for us right now. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this word, and we ask that we will... We won't remain the same, Lord. We won't remain the same in the mighty name of Jesus. We just give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. And I want us to, I want to give people an opportunity to, to say a prayer of salvation. That is, if you never really given your life to Christ and never really heard of, uh, on the scripture of faith or whatever it might be, and I just want to share with you that Christ has died already for your sins. And there is salvation for you. So just say after me. Thank you Jesus for dying for me. I give my life to you. I turn away from my old life of sin. And I ask you to come into my life. I believe that I am saved by grace. And through faith. Amen. Amen.